I'm going to make a, a little different approach tonight. We're going to kind of do a, a Wednesday night approach, actually. So I'd really like for you to uh, zero in and track with me in the Scriptures because we're really wanting to be uh, very clear and very precise and uh, very biblical in relationship to Matthew chapter 12, verse 21, which, of course, is the uh, pivotal verse of the entire discourse. Uh, as you know, there's been the controversy that's been going on throughout the chapter. And as they have plotted murder, they have now come and criticized Jesus for being uh, possessed with the devil and is literally doing the casting out demons by the power of demons in verse 24. And then Jesus in verse 25 uh, down through verse uh, 30 gives this uh, phenomenal discourse. In verse 31 is the pivotal verse. So he moves into this discourse, which begins at verse 25 and goes down through verse 30. And that discourse is basically a logical uh, play out of exactly what he's trying to say to them. I mean, it's very logical. He's taking an argumentative view, a view of it. He's approaching it from that perceptive, perception and gives very logical steps of why what they're saying doesn't make any sense. And then he comes to verse 31, and you'll note he begins in verse 31 by stating, therefore, and the word therefore, you know, of course, means that what I'm going to tell you is based upon what I've already told you. So based upon this logical approach that I've tried to make to this subject, I now want to give you this. And he moves into this, uh, into this section, which goes from verse 31 down through verse 37. And obviously the very core or the very beginning or the very heart of this whole entire section is verse 31. And it is actually the summary, the summary of everything he's going to say. So understanding verse 31 becomes the very key uh, to the entire passage itself. So we want to uh, spend some time on that and begin to walk through that. Did you fix it? What a guy. You're much better than Sean. Now, he's, he begins by saying, yeah, we are on a blank. Okay. Ah, oh, so we are fixed. Thank you. Uh, so he begins in verse 31 with the word therefore and then launches into this summary statement. And we've been dealing with this summary statement. And, of course, the beginning statement is every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Now, walk with me on this. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. Uh, there are no exceptions to that. I mean, he's really strong, so that ought to be shouting news. And we've walked through this, and we're not going to take a lot of time, but I just want to remind you of uh, the, the walkthrough. Sin, we discovered, was the word harmatia, which is missing the mark. And the idea of we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God is very clear in all of our minds. And in the context, you have to define sin as he's referring to it, as he's talking to these leaders of Israel or these Jews, uh, however they were, as he has walked through with them through these, through these uh, controversies uh, in the grain field and then in the synagogue and then in a conference room and now in the theological classroom. Uh, in that context, you have a definition of sin being given to us. So we didn't just make this up, is what I'm trying to say to you. We didn't just say, oh, let's make up a definition of sin. No, it's missing the mark, and he's talking to them about how they missed the mark. And how did they miss the mark? They missed the mark by focusing on legalism instead of on relationship. They thought that sin was in the activity of a deed and not doing or doing something that, you, that they thought you should not do. They thought of, of sin in those terms. Jesus confronted them on the issue of sin in terms of relationship, relationship with himself. And while they wouldn't pick grain on the Sabbath day and eat it, they certainly would not have relationship with him and would plot murder on the Sabbath day and would crucify him. And it was a relational deal. It wasn't about an activity. It was about a relationship. So the whole focus of sin was on relationship. And it flows in Revelation. Because in every one of those situations, Jesus leaned into them and said, oh, please, let me give you some revelation on this. 
And he gave them additional truth. He, he walked them through stories of the Old Testament that they were totally familiar with. He literally talked to them strongly about this whole concept of the revelation. And it constantly, he, he unfolded that whole, whole scene to them. And of course, it forced them, it always forces response. They couldn't leave it alone. They couldn't go home and take a nap. It was impossible for them to drop it. They had to aggressively pursue it. But then that's the way sin is. It will not let you stay neutral or idle or it does not decrease. It always increase. It always becomes of greater degree than it was before. So he's defined sin for us in the passage. Now you'll note he says in verse 31, sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. So we discovered that blasphemy is the, really the word blasphemia, which is a transliteralization of the word. And it focuses on the soul. Again, we didn't make that up. We're looking at the context of the chapter and how he's referring it to, how he's referring to it in relationship to them. And it focuses on the very issue of the soul itself. In other words, it came from within them. And the blasphemy, the blasphemia that he's talking about to them is the issue of, you'll remember that blaspheme or blast, this is literally... Uh, to uh, this is uh, stupid and this is to speak. So it's the idea of speaking stupid things is the idea. And that focuses on the inner soul of man itself. So what we're dealing with is what's coming from within you and it focuses in the spirit in the fact that what's deep within you spills through your spirit, which we're referring to attitude here. So it began to spill through the uh, Pharisees and the leaders of Israel into their attitude towards Jesus and towards the disciples and towards all that was taking place. And it forced them to speak. They could not keep still about it. They had to open up their mouth. They had to talk. They didn't. It just forced them, forced them, which is, of course, the word itself. Blasphemia. Now, it's interesting that you could spend hours and hours talking about sin and blasphemia, but he moves us into something that's just really exciting, and that is the idea of forgiveness. Because he says, all sin and all blasphemia, speaking stupid things, can, is forgiven. Every single one. Did you get that? It's very strong on that. It's an opening statement. It's very forceful. He won't, he won't budge on that. So there's total, absolute forgiveness for every sin and every blasphemia. Now we come to the contrast. But the blasphemia against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And we want to try to deal with that. I want you to see it in the original language. And I want you to look carefully with the flow of how it looks. And of course, the English is, uh, the Greek is in the parentheses. Just in case you can't read my writing. The, but, the, spirit, blasphemia, not forgiven. Interesting statement as you look at it in the Greek language. Uh, if I were to ask you, uh, by the way, uh, blasphemia, this, that isn't drawing lines, is it? So, That's the subject of the sentence. Not forgiven, obviously, is the verb. The spirit is in the genitive, which establishes in the Greek language relationship. So there is a relationship between spirit and blasphemia. And he, Jesus himself, is making that connection. The subject, again, blasphemia. The verb, not forgiven. And spirit is connected to the blasphemia, which becomes very important in the passage. 
if I were to turn to you and say, uh, well, let's start with this first. Uh, this whole thing focuses on speaking. It focuses on speaking. Now, we're getting that from four places in the passage. One is the definition of blasphemy itself, which is given to us in verse 31. We've already told you that blasphemy or blasics is literally uh, stupid and femia is speaking. So the whole action of the word itself is wrapped up in what comes out of your mouth. So there isn't any question that what he's dealing with in the subject of that which is not forgiven is what comes out of your mouth. The blasphemia, it's the definition of the word itself. It's also a deliberate statement because you'll look in verse 32 and it says, anyone who speaks a word again. So Jesus deliberately comes out and says, I'm talking about your mouth. I'm talking about what you say. I'm talking about your speaking. It will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. So obviously, the whole focus is on your speaking. We see that from the definition of the word itself. We see that from the deliberate statement Jesus makes in verse 32. We see it in verse 33 through verse 35 as a description the, through the description of the tree. He says, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. Now he's paralleling what comes out of your mouth as a tree producing fruit. In fact, you'll note he goes on and gives you that parallel. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now he just got done saying a tree, a good tree bears forth good fruit. Now he's saying, how can you, being evil, speak good things? So obviously, the whole emphasis of the description of the tree is on the idea of speaking. It's also found in the determination at judgment. For if you go down to verse 36 and 37, he moves into the end judgment itself, and the whole idea is on speaking, and every idle word that man may speak he will give account of it in the day of judgment, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So definitely the whole focus of, the, of this uh, idea of blasphemia is on the idea of uh, speaking. Now, the flow of blasphemia, he says, is from the Spirit. Now, if you go back... Uh, to the passage in verse 31, if I would ask you tonight, what is the unpardonable sin? What would you say? I can give you the standard answer I've always heard. What would you say? From the passage, what is the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's what I have been taught. And how many of you have ever heard of an unpardonable sin? Well, I would like to change your thinking. There is no unpardonable sin. Look at the passage. Come on, you believe the Bible, don't you? Look at the passage. You'll note at the beginning of verse 31, he takes sin and blasphemia and separates it. Every sin and blasphemia will be forgiven. And then in the next statement, he says, but the blasphemia, and he drops the whole concept of sin. So it isn't an unpardonable sin. It's an unpardonable blasphemia. Hello? You, I, you, I lost you? Okay. Well, back up again. He says, Every sin and blasphemy, he divides sin and blasphemy. Blasphemia. He divides it. In other words, there's two categories going here. There's sin, and all sins are forgiven, and all blasphemias are forgiven. And then he says, but wait a minute. There is an aspect of blasphemia that's not forgivable. 
But he's dropped the whole concept of sin. So it's not an unpardonable sin. It's an unpardonable blasphemia. I would say, if you push me against the wall, that all, uh, all sins, all blasphemias may be sin in their end result, but not every sin is a blasphemia. For instance, when he's, obviously when he's talking about blasphemia, he's not talking about adultery. Because this is all wrapped up and focused on, uh, this is all wrapped up and focused on speaking. So blasphemy is limited to the, the concept and is a spatial kind of. So technically, if you were going to really speak about this correctly, you would not speak of an unpardonable sin. You would speak of an unpardonable blasphemy. Now, all sins then are forgivable, but there is an aspect or a part of or a section of blasphemia which is not forgiven. Well, what is that? Now, in the passage, in my translation, it says against. Uh, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemia will be forgiven men, but the blasphemia against the Spirit. That's the translation. Now, let's go back to the way it's given to us in the original language. Do you see any place in there the word against? Here it is in the Greek. The, but, the, spirit, blasphemia, not forgiven. Do you see at any place again, the word against there? So against is an interpretation. They are saying, this is the subject. I agree with that. Not forgiven. I agree with that. The spirit is related to blasphemia and is in the genitive case, which tells you what? It tells you that it has a relationship with blasphemy. Now the question is, what is the relationship here? They say it is against. That's an interpretation. You'll also note that it is in capital S. And the reason they're saying it is against, and the reason they're saying it's capital S, is because they're translating it in light of verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. So since, of, since verse 32 says against the Holy Spirit, they have come and translated this, the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit and they've put the word against in there, which agrees then with verse 32. So they've translated verse 32 in light, uh, they've translated verse 31 in light of verse 32. What would happen if we would reverse that? Suppose we would translate verse 32 in light of verse 31. It would be different. Could it be that this is not against, in the, se- in the fact of speaking against, that this is about, not a capital S, but is about my spirit, little s. What's in me, what I'm like, in my inner heart, and in my inner nature, and that is related to blasphemia, meaning it's coming from my inner heart. And my inner nature, and it's coming out of me from the depth of my inner. Does that coincide? Does that coincide with the with the with the with the passage, with the with the context of the passage? And I want to suggest to you, it does, because when you go to the controversy of the grain fields, what is happening in the controversy of the grain fields? There's something coming out of them that is criticizing the disciples for picking grain on the Sabbath day, and when Jesus tries to enlighten them and lays out three distinct different passages and incidences in the Old Testament that the lights just ought to go on in their minds and their heart, and they say, oh, you're right. 
They don't do that. They move into the synagogue, and you'll remember in verse 9, they literally came to the synagogue with the on purpose to accuse him because they were all upset about the grain field. And they came to, we'll nail him on this one, and they brought in a man with a withered hand so they could get him to heal the guy and because they knew he would, and they would, could accuse him, so they plotted against him, which was a manifestation of what was in their heart in the grain field. And while it began in the grain field, it increased in the synagogue. And what's the next scene? They've gathered in the conference room and are plotting murder, which really reveals what they're in, what, what's going on inside. And Jesus gave them revelation in this scene and gave them revelation in this scene, and they still went to the conference room and plotted murder. So what does all of that tell you? It, all, the, all of that tells you that there's something going on inside of them that is literally spilling in and out of them and it's literally going to the very heart of their, it's literally spilling from the very heart of their inner system and that it flows from their spirit. So I'm suggesting to you this is not about against at all. And this is not about Holy Spirit at all in this verse. This is about my inner spirit. And then when he moves to verse 32, he's talking about, hey, the Son of Man is standing in front of you, and he's giving you words, and you, and, and you, just, you just remove him. You just don't pay any attention to him. You speak against him. Hey, that's okay. But when the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit that comes to your spirit, and speaks to you in your inner spirit and draws you into revelation, when you shut him down, you've got problems. And to tell you the truth, he says, that is absolutely unforgivable. Do you mean it's unforgivable because God gets mad and says, well, if you're going to be that way, I'll just take my toys and go home. No, the reason it's unforgivable is because it cannot be forgiven. What do you mean it can't be forgiven? Because forgiving, forgiveness is not the cure of that. Oh, my transmission is acting up. I know what I'll do. I'll change my spark plugs. That isn't going to help. Because spark plugs don't have anything to do with transmissions. And when you've got an inner heart that is rejecting truth, forgiveness doesn't apply. Forgiveness is always there, but it doesn't solve the problem of a heart that is shutting down truth and a heart that is being expressed in the controversy in the grain fields and the controversy in the synagogue and the controversy in the conference room. This is not about I forgive you. Sure, I'll forgive you, but that doesn't solve the problem of what's going on in your spirit in this scene. What is the answer to what goes on in the spirit in this scene? The scripture is so absolutely plain, and Jesus, and we'll get into that in the rest of the uh, as we, as we continue on our study on this, that Jesus is so strong, the Apostle Paul is so strong that the answer to all of this is in crucifixion. So, this whole thing about, but the blasphemia against the Spirit will not be forgiven, focuses on speaking... Because it's blasphemia, stupid to speak, st speaking stupid things. It's a deliberate statement by Jesus. He calls it speaking. He describes it in terms of the tree and good things coming out of a bad, uh, coming out of a bad tree. Impossible, he says. It's, de it's a determination at judgment because on the judgment day, you're going to be judged by what comes out of your mouth. Why is that, he says, because it flows from the Spirit. And it's not against the Holy Spirit. It's flowing from the inner spirit of your own being. And what flows from the inner spirit of your own being literally is the determining factor. It can't be forgiven. Well, no, it isn't about, oh, I forgive you for all the nasty things you are saying in your inner heart. 
No, that doesn't solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem? I've got to do something about your inner heart. What could he do about the inner heart? Well, it forces, and I didn't get this written out. It forces, uh, and this is found uh, actually in um, the rest of the chapter, which is the summary. It forces slaughter. In other words, the answer is crucifixion. It's been interesting in the Hebrews class that we're getting into the chapter 9, which is the, chap the blood chapter, and that the whole scene of the blood chapter is about slaughter. The Scripture uses that word. Let me read you a verse. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, which is the imagery of crucifixion. And the only thing that could happen to a heart, to a spirit, to an inner nature that's constantly shutting God down, constantly rejecting him, constantly not listening, constantly listening to his own voice, uh, the, the voice of his own inner spirit than the voice of the spirit. The only solution to a person like that, the only solving of the problem for a person like that is he's got to die. That can't be forgiven. That would be changing spark plugs for a transmission problem. There has to come a death. It's the only solution. It's the only possibility. Who would want to die? Jesus, no unpardonable sin. Wow. The only thing that's unpardonable, can't be forgiven, is that which is deep, deep within me that won't accept you, and that's got to die. It's amazing to me, you are so gracious. You come, you wrap your arm around me. You offer forgiveness for every evil thing I've ever done, every evil thing I've ever spoken, every evil thing I've ever thought. You come and just graciously, graciously forgive. Grace is poured out all over me. Mercy is extended my way. You just give me that. But the one thing you can't forgive is the inner condition of my own carnal mind, self-sourcing, Shut you down, won't listen to you. Listen to my own stupid speaking instead of your inner voice. I invite you tonight to break me. I invite you to come to the depth of my heart. I don't want to listen to my own voice anymore. I don't want to listen to my own stupid speaking anymore. And I know you can't forgive me for the rebellion of my inner heart. Come and bring my heart to death. Let your death be my death. That your life might be my life. And come and radically revolutionize, transform, bring rebirth to the very inner nature of my being. Is that what you really want? Do it in my heart. Heads are bowed. You've experienced forgiveness. Have you experienced death? All the guilt, graciously forgiven. What about what can't be forgiven?
slaughter. Strong term. It's the call of the cross. Altars open. Moments of seeking.